and the three of you, um, have you all met each other and talked with each other? Well, we haven't really, no, I know of you. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, it's nice to have all three of you together. <laughs> thank, uh, thank you again. I'll say it again. So, do you want to come and sit down here? Those seats are reserved just for you. Nobody <laughs> else. Only you. Yes. Yes, we have you. three right now. Coming in. Hello, come on in. Hello, come, come and sit down here. Uh, so, for, uh, let me just do a quick check here. We had an interesting sound issue. Hello. 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 Oh, that's a good beard. Keep it coming. Keep it coming. <laughs> no, I was going to say, you got a way to go. Okay, the key is. That's all right. People will ask me how long it take to grow this. I say, you know, two weeks. They go, okay, wait a minute. You know, but, you know. <laughs> so you can mess with them. You could say it took me 10 years. And then you can build an elaborate story, you know. You had the special powders you had to apply to grow it just right. You know. And and we, we just, I met you earlier today, didn't I? Oh, I guess today we didn't. We met at the Internet 2007. Oh, you oh, have wow. a fantastic memory. That was great in Valencia. Yeah, exactly. Which is a wonderful place to be, yes. It is, definitely. Remind me of your name, I'm sorry. My name is Nina. Yeah. And where are you from? I'm from Hamburg. Ah, excellent, yeah. excellent. And you, sir, I, I can barely see your badge at all. Okay, and what's your name? David. David. It's not the most German name I've ever heard in my life. Yeah, really? <laughs> we can do that. So we have two minutes to go. Are you from Hamburg too? Yeah. So your colleagues. Your colleagues. Fine. Well, what's your name? Eileen. What about you. you two? You're not with them. <laughs> <laughs> you see that? The big yes. cavernous gap between them? It's in the You're both from France. Like Coneheads. Yes. Tell them your names again. Welcome. Welcome, both of you. Um, we'll start this in about one and a half minutes. We'll give some time for a few other people to show up. Oh, we have Roxanne. Excellent. Hello, Roxanne. Um, so we've, we've been doing this for about um, almost four years. And so every week we have a different guest usually. Uh, and the guest can be anyone from a university president to a great reporter to a venture capitalist, to an inventor, to a librarian, to a critic. Um, we have a lot of different people, mostly from the US, although quite a few from around the world. And then we meet in this virtual space, uh, technology is called Shindig, uh, and then we converse, uh, and there's no presentation. I've got a couple of slides, I'm just gonna show them and then get rid of them, but then it's all conversation. Uh, the goal is to take advantage of the technology, which lets us have video and audio, so that we can see Olivier's smiling face mm -hmm. and hear his voice, um, and then to have questions going uh, from everybody involved. And that's that's the ethos of this. It's purely conversational. Yes. <laughs> Usually in the same day and time. Yeah, but there's a lot to there's a lot to cover. So you know, we have one person talking about um, charitable donations. We had another person talking about what is it like to be a president. We had another person talking about mental health issues. Someone talking about virtual reality. Someone talking about gaming. I mean, every week there's a lot of stuff to cover. And then we come back to some people. Audrey mm -hmm. was our very first guest almost four years ago. Um, so in 2016. Um, and so if people's work changes or something happens, we interviewed the head of a fantastic new college from uh, Providence, Rhode Island. Wonderful, wonderful school. And they had just started off. They weren't accredited yet. So they got accredited. So we talked to them after that to see how they changed. Right. Well, I think we have the top of the hour. And so let me begin. Let me say, uh, we welcome everybody. We welcome you to the Future Trends Forum, people who are here in person as well as people who are online. Um, so to the virtual people, hello to Ed, Roxanne, Barbara, Tom, and Tom. And it's especially nice to see Ed Webb because he has great questions for the show, but he's never able to make it in person. So I'm glad to actually see him. 
Uh, we're coming to you live from Berlin, Germany, in the middle of the OED conference. So we have a live audience. In fact, I'm just going to get a little vertiginous here and turn the camera around so you can see all these people here. Hello. <laughs> and we have three fantastic uh, people to talk with tonight. So we will introduce each one of them one by one. <laughs> Um, went, sorry, um, we just uh, quickly had our signal blip. Right. So th there was yeah. there was glitter, there were there were beads, and there were shiny lights hung up uh, all over the room. And when I got there, the, uh, it, the people were just buzzing <laughs> and chatting and talking, and it was just it was wonderful. Yeah, was and we were doing a lot of drawing and. And yeah. drawing was, and you had yeah. you had footprint documents. Well, the footprints, feet. of course, you've got to leave footprints for the future, great. haven't you? Of, of course. course. Why would you not? I'm hoping to get some from you today. Well, I, I will. <laughs> my, my my feet are, are like Yeti feet, so I'm, I'm happy to do. But the, but let me ask then, as leading the workshop, and as being here today. Yes. What what are some of the thoughts and themes and, and mm. what's the vibe that you've gotten from OAB? Well, and you've yeah. been doing this for a while. Yeah, I have. You know, like yeah. Well, 15? this is year twenty five, and I think I've missed three since the beginning. Oh, well, and out, out with you! Don't one, want to hear. It. Yeah. So, I mean, in the very beginning, like going back 20 plus years, um, most people had European projects and were talking about experimenting with software development. So you can see over the time where now this conference is really talking about influencing and, and positively constructing the future by all the ways um, we're talking about real prototypes like Olivia as well. It's a bit more than a prototype now, isn't it, really, that is building mm. up. Mm. Um, mm. You know, so I think it has gone. I mean, if in systems terms, I think we've pushed the boundaries again and again and ah. again and again. And because it makes it more complex, it makes it harder, it makes yeah. multiple perspectives on the problem. But mm. now, in the last, probably the last couple of years, we've added the mix of the complex adaptive system that's the future mm. Mm. to it. So we've, had the, we've added the temporal dimension, not only what we're doing, why we're doing it, how it's working. But where it's going. Um, and of course, it is one of the few conferences that I attend that really crosses all education sectors from sort of mm -hmm. kindergarten, and compulsory education, higher education, which I've already stayed in always stayed in and um you know and then into corporate learning there's right. a very big corporate right. learning and development contingent here. yes and we all talk to each other that must be good well, that must be good it, it, <laughs> and the three of you here on the stage in fact the four of us yeah. each represent very very different careers mm. and different, yeah but let me just ask for those of you the six of you in the audience the face-to-face -face audience how many of you are from primary and secondary schools how many of you are from universities and colleges? Mm. How many of you are from corporate learning? And <laughs> you two, where are you from? <laughs> okay, post-MBA, graduate, secondary, or post-secondary. That would be higher education, yeah? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. I yeah. think so. Yeah. I like the secrecy and mystery, though. That you're saying. <laughs> well, we can neither confirm nor deny this. Um, uh, so, um, thinking as well about um, if I can, if I can bring Olivier back in, into this as well. You heard the debate that just happened, mm -hmm. and so you were you were brought on to to argue about the principle that thinking of economics is a problem in higher education, or what was the exact proposition you were arguing? Um, the proposition, this house believes that an obsession for economics is harming education. Yes, and and you heard this, this raucous heard debate. That, and I voted for his side. How did how did the debate go? What did um, you think overall? Uh, well, we didn't win. Yeah. <laughs> so you were convinced by him, but yeah, you were in the minority. Uh, probably. Well, it's one of those things that, I mean, it actually, in... in in the statement, it was talking about obsession with it. Yes. Whereas, in fact, yes. I don't think we're obsessed with it. Okay. Um, but we want to be inclusive. So, I mean, in my my work, which is trying to understand new curricula for the future, which is what I'm working on very much now, mm -hmm. um, it looks like from the student point of view, of course, they want careers, they want to earn money, right. and sometimes, you know, the new generation is considered to be focusing on that. Um, but 
they also want to make a contribution. They do want to be prepared, you know, for for long working lives and with good companies and and organisations. And so I think it, the answer was probably some sort of balance. And um, but I didn't want to be accused of sitting on the fence since I'm a Brit and everyone's sitting on the fence. In oh, the don't, UK don't, don't you're not going to talk about fences. Uh, no, I promise I'm not. But it's pretty miserable. <laughs> oh, it's, it is. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry. But this is, but the, but the part of it's an artificial, you know, the structure of the debate yeah. is designed yeah, to, to right. force that. To take like, different sides. Yeah. Let, let, let me ask everybody, what uh, what questions do you have for Jilly? Either about her workshop or her approach to uh, um, 4.0 learning or, <laughs> or about to this question of uh, curriculum or economics? And this is, of course, a question for everybody who was involved here um, on the uh, online as well. Um, Uh, one quick note, um, were we actually gone from the virtual audience for 20 minutes? That's really bad. Oh, so, no, we didn't realize that. Um, Sorry about that. Well, it's okay. We we're recording this, so we'll repeat this uh, on yeah. YouTube. Um, but uh, um, what questions do you all have in the face-to-face -face room? They're just they're just intimidated by you. No? <laughs> Sorry, it's just I don't know your, your background as a professor, but was there Ah. Oh, right. Okay. So this is a biographical question about your background oh, right. as a faculty okay. member. Did this lead you to... Yeah, sure. Um, I've worked in the area of online learning. I started off at the Open University. Um, my original research and practice has always been in large-scale online learning. Um, and I gradually became more and more interested in, in attempting to create or at least influence the future for that. Um, and, and I mean, the main reason I did it is that I, I went to Australia for seven years and worked there, loved it. Um, but I was at the point where I needed to come back. Um, my children wondered where I'd gone and, you know, they thought it was time. And I kept getting grandchildren being born in London that, also wanted to meet me, so I came back from. Oh, oh, wow. <laughs> so I came back, and um, and then I, when I was in Swinburne University in Melbourne, um, it it started a joint venture um, with a um, an Australian company to support <laughs> the university to provide online learning on a large scale which of course is a lot of companies around now doing that. Mm. And it was very successful. Mm. Um, uh, but I was on the university side, so I, I, you know, I was making it work for the university. Um, but then when they knew I was back in London, um, they said, oh, we're going to start up in the UK. So it seemed mm. a mm. natural mm. progression. Um, it seemed like destiny. Yeah, it seemed a natural thing to do to have a go and I have to say I thought it would be easy to make that shift I haven't found it easy really so that's what's good for you isn't it to do something different to get another perspective um, mm. but it is it is a way of deploying my long-term work which is about um, learning design you know the use of technology for for student focus um, actually understanding a whole range of technologies which I've moved with over the years. So I did see it as a way of fulfilling another aspect of my long-term work and, and we'll still do it actually. I think I'm going to go and learn to code. That should be I, I know a thing. great school for that. <laughs> to see anybody over 18. <laughs> I know and, and it's interesting because you know I do really think that if I'm going to carry on working past retirement age, which is what I'm already doing, or the traditional mm. Mm. retirement age, I do need to look for new things. It's not that I don't want to use what I've done before, but mm. I need to look for new applications and new directions mm. for what I'm doing. And so, yeah. You're embodying you life on earth. We don't have a campus in the UK. So far. It's so about yeah. time, isn't it? Probably. Mm. Wow, that would be remarkable. Something yeah. in Europe investing in... The UK. Yeah. Oh. I think it should be someone inside the UK who wants to invest in the UK. I think you'll find some okay. really 
desperate people. Yes. Actually, <laughs> yes. I know who we can ask. I'll follow up with you. I'm glad you two met. <laughs> <laughs> um, Thank you. Yeah, yeah, please, please. Uh, which which tools? Do you prefer? Which right. tools do you prefer okay. for online learning? Well, for some sort of volume, you you're going to have to use a VLE or an LMS. Um, but I don't find them adequate to do everything that I would want to do. Um, Can you say a little bit about why? Why? Um, well, they've grown up um, to be, you know, safe, secure, not right. creative. And of course, if you're uh -huh. dealing with five, ten, twelve thousand 12,000 students, you have to have something like that for all the reasons that are obvious, they've got to be secure and not right. subject to DDoS attacks every day and all the right. rest of it. Right. However, um, I'm doing a huge amount of work in the, mo in the moment with robotics, with video, right. and with the whole aspect of creativity. So, so what Brian described that I'll do in face-to-face, -face, I'm constantly attempting to reproduce that in remote online environments. So I'm just about any tool anyone hands me, I have a go with, to be quite honest. Um, I wouldn't say there's just one thing or another. So you're embodying what we what we like to see? For oh, really? <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you. Good question. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Thanks. Yes, please. Okay. Let me repeat this. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so I, let me just repeat that for people who can't hear. It. No, that's quite all right. It's quite all right. I, I, uh, it's a lush, wonderful question. Um, but quickly, the idea is how can you recreate the face to face environment from a, a physical classroom or a meeting session like this online? And the combination of frustration and face to face engagement um, that's peer to peer, which is a key term you use. Is there a particular tool that you found that does that? And I will add, maybe, sorry, um, uh, does, uh, it leads, uh, does it leads you to the classic uh, MOOC dropout you mm. can see mm. uh, in mm. many, many different situations where mm. uh, MOOCs are way not followed up yeah. to the end mm. yeah. by many people who are starting a MOOC. Okay. Um, right. M my work is not with MOOCs, although I have run MOOCs as well, and a, mm. a lot of my pedagogical frameworks are used for MOOCs and will make a difference. However, what I do is full degree courses over a period of time entirely online, but at volume and, and with global um, students. So I think what I would do is come back and say, I think you can, to a certain extent, use a technology tool like this one and if you structure it appropriately, it will have some similarities and some differences, and you can emulate some of what we're doing now. Yeah. However, rather than be frustrated about that, it's better to go back and look at the pedagogical frameworks that have been developed that add great value um, to the very special characteristics of creating an online environment, which is a different sort of environment, and then designing for that, um, rather than saying this is the only and the best way of doing it, and somehow we've got to reproduce that um, through technology. So the answer is no, there is no one tool that will fix that. Um, but you, you need to, to look at the concepts that you're 
you're wanting. And if yours is the collaboration, which, for example, in management education, where I've worked a lot, is critically important. Um, and then the whole range from actually getting people together. I, I've developed something called the five stage model, which is fairly well known, which is a scaffold of people gradually working together, which usually uses mainly asynchronous technologies. And you can develop very strong bonds and networks um, through that. So it does come back to learning design and then also appropriate human intervention mm. to support the students on their journey. So it's a bit of a longer story, um, but I suppose my quick answer would be, no, there isn't a tool that will do that for you. You've got to design for what you want to achieve, but it is possible. <laughs> thank you for that question. Yeah. And thank you for that great answer. Okay. <laughs> uh, speaking of questions and answers, if you're new to the forum, you can see from the diversity of questions, um, just how rich the conversation can be. And let me ask our virtual folks, um, if you would like to ask questions either, uh, you can type them in by the uh, text chat button by pressing the question mark button, or you can join us up here on stage uh, if you'd like to uh, ask another question. Um, well, I, can I ask so, you please, you can ask the question. Actually, that made me think, um, since you, 42 has no teachers, um, how do you deal with uh, pedagogical instructional design and how do you help the students get there? We do have a small team in 42. Oh, hang on, hang on. For, uh, almost, uh, no, so a little bit more than uh, 4,000. Just, just do that. Just. Uh, for a little bit more than 4,000 uh, students, so we have a crew of 35 people. And this crew includes six people dedicated to the pedagogy. We have a, a, another uh, eight people team who is creating the intranet. The intranet is used by all the students, and the intranet is designed so every student can be completely autonomous. And the pedagogical team will use the intranet to design the uh, curriculum to um, create the different uh, projects that are asked mm. to the students, the challenge, and the connection between the challenge, because it's, uh, it works just like, um, I would say, a tree graph. Uh, you start, everyone starting from the, the, with the same five projects, and at some point, you start to have different branches, and students will be able to make mm. their own mm. choice inside the curriculum. And every project is connected to the previous one, so when the previous one is completed, then it unlocks the next project of the program. All this design and the rules to how, how to progress, the rules have been created by the pedagogical team. It's implemented in the intranet by the um, development team, we have a dedicated team for that, and then the students are following this on the intranet. So there is a lot of learning design yeah. going into it, in fact. Yeah. Mm. Or has already gone into it. Yeah. I mean, that, that you have 42 is a, there's been, a, in video terms, there's a lot of pre-production that has gone into this. We do have um, a small amount of pre-production. We are not creating any kind of content uh, because we want our students to also develop um, uh, skills about facing the huge amount of data that is, yeah. exists on the yeah. internet and developing the skills on how to filter this uh, huge amount of data so that the students uh, will uh, be able to figure out what is important, what is relevant in ICT, what is obsolete or not, uh, what is completely false, because sometimes you can go into a website and a blog explaining how to code stuff and to be, to be realize that it's, somewhat, it's completely fake or it's completely mm. not understood by the creator of, the, yeah. of this web page. Yeah. And uh, you need, of course, to test everything to figure out if it's true, if it's uh, not true. And it's the same when you debate with each other. It's compelling because you need to debate with each other and to have some input from someone else. And yeah. anytime you need to have a doubt about all the information you get from the internet and uh, um, a doubt on the information you get from your neighbors and your colleagues uh, who are facing the same challenge. So that's why we are, do not create any content. 
if we create some kind of content, the students will stuck with this content and say, okay, if the school created this, so the answer is what the school did create, and I just need to follow what the school is telling me in this video yeah. uh, without any kind of doubt and testing and, and nothing. So that's why we completely remove the um, um, pointing at creating some content or pointing at some specific content. Uh, yeah, it's it, interestingly, it's not terribly different from the framework I was talking about, which actually just uses a spark to start the dialogue. So something is offered, but that's all. A spark. A spark. So it's ah. called a, you, you know, it, you, you, it might be a YouTube video, you might might be a saying, it might, you know, a poem, all sorts of different things. And then um, then you'll direct them off on the task at mm. that point. Mm. So he has given you a model to a certain extent there that the way it works best with large scale online learning too. Yes, thank you for making the connection back. Um, I have the feeling that after in a few minutes they're going to storm the stage. So I want to get what I what I can after that. Um, <laughs> thank you for asking these questions. Can can I ask you, Shall Julie I and with Audrey, Audrey? Could you, if I can bring Audrey to the hot seat? And Julie, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, I think it's very unlikely that people don't know who Audrey Waters is. Um, I mean, especially since she's the first guest on the Future Transform, she's well known, I think, as one of EdTech's fiercest and most powerful critics. She's a founder of a project, I think, I'm calling it a website is too small, uh, <laughs> Hack Education. Um, she has published numerous ebooks. Uh, she has also just finished a book about the history of EdTech, which is due out from which press? MIT Press. It's due out in 2020? Um, sure. It might <laughs> coincide with something that the U.S. is doing in November, so I might see if we can push it back. November, I can't think of what, don't, don't push back the election, please. Um, we could. Oh, no, 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 no. Because they, yeah, never mind. No, we, should, is, it's, we can talk about that later. Yeah, if, if it's depressing. Want. If we want. Um, uh, Audrey is just one of the greatest people I know in this field, um, and uh, always a pleasure uh, to have here. And so this morning, you were one of the plenary speakers. Um, and you gave a devastating critique <laughs> of what you called the uh, EdTech imaginary, mm -hmm. uh, where you described the ways in which EdTech lunges towards utopia, but actually succeeds in plowing a furrow towards dystopia. And you broke this down in many ways. So the question I'd like to ask you, and all of you will have questions, I know, is how did people respond? I mean, you were expecting heckling. You were expecting I was booze. expecting. I was expecting heckling, um, and I ended, identified where the hecklers were in the audience. So, I, so, but um, fortunately, there was. They were cowed by my ferocity. Right. They were. <laughs> and um, what did people the, say? I think the response that I heard was overwhelmingly positive, and I think it was interesting to see some of the chatter, ongoing chatter today with people mm. pushing back at me and saying that they were sure that these things were true. And then sort of me pointing to sources and um, saying, perhaps, perhaps not. Oh, you mean like the uh, end number of jobs will cease to exist? Right, right, right. 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 yeah. Uh, Benjamin Dockstader was here. He was. And another guest in the Future Transform uh, last year. Yeah. Um, and so it was nice of you to name check him and to see him. Also another man with a good beard, just to let you know. <laughs> um, <laughs> but. Um, so those myths still hold? I think they do hold. And I think that, you know, I think that they're incredibly powerful. I think that, I mean, I think that you and I are definitely, our backgrounds are in literature. I think Great that so. we understand the power of story, mm -hmm. um, the power of mythology, mm -hmm. um, and sort of the elevation of certain stories to, to truths. Um, that then sort of become unquestionable. Mm. Um, mm. I mean, and that's what, you know, we, we use the word myth often to mean things that are not true, like that's just a myth. Right. But actually the myths are our most important stories. Mm. The myths are, are are truths. And so I think that education technology does have a lot of myths in terms of things that we just don't challenge, things that we don't really question, the inevitability, the inevitability of the forward march mm. of you know, sort of this teleology uh -huh. that things get faster and more digital. And I think it's worth just asking, asking ourselves to sort of think, think more carefully about the, the stories that we hear and definitely think more carefully about the stories we tell. 
I, I have a sideways question on that, but I would love to hear questions from everybody else first. Um, so anybody uh, in the audience, um, and uh, actually, let me bring up one of the um, uh, one of the folks in the audience uh, who has several questions, and I've been I have not yet beamed him up. So let's see if he can show up. Let's go here, oops, there we go. Tom, can you hear us? Yeah, I can hear you. Can you hear me? I very well. Awesome. Yeah, it's going back and forth from the US back to with Germany and back to the U.S. So, well, I, I had a question earlier about economics, but I, we can fold all these things together. Um, the question about economics I had was: Do we really know what if we're, if, we're, if education is a bet on the future? So, if we're educating for the future, do we know what that future looks like ten years down the road? Um, which is kind of related to the second question in the sense that um, I'm trying to get a handle on what um, Audrey's thrust is with some of this stuff is the argument that technology is driving pedagogy instead of pedagogy driving technology. And if so, yeah, absolutely. Um, machines don't make us, we should make the machines. Uh, but uh, are those, those two things are semi-related, but um, um, if you can stitch them together, bravo. <laughs> <laughs> Those are two huge questions, Tom. And let me, let me, if I can, let me just segment them out so that we can chew on them. But just yeah. quickly, uh, where are you at uh, home in uh, the Houston no, area? I'm at my in-laws' house in oh. Pennsylvania. <laughs> Excellent. That's right. Away. That's right. And I should say to all the Americans in the audience, thank you for participating in the Future Trends Forum on Thanksgiving Day. Yeah. That's a really nice sign. Um, and Tom is a, a good friend of the program and has been a, a very great supporter of us from the beginning and always ask good questions like he just did now. So let's start off with this idea of how do we plan for educational technology for the next 10 years, thinking about the economy and so on, when we have such fuzzy knowledge of it. I mean, you were devastating this morning, in our, as were a few other speakers, our, our inability to model 10 years out. So how can we do this? I think, I mean, I... One thing I, I think that we should resist is this is the notion that things don't change and that things have never changed. Uh, things have changed mm -hmm. substantially. Mm -hmm. I think that we don't always notice it as, as uh, uh, Larry Cuban and David Tyke wrote, right? This is sort of tinkering towards utopia. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, that the shifts are not always as dramatic again as these sweeping narratives that we talk that we you know that we use to talk about education revolutions. Mm -hmm. um, things have shifted. Demographics, you talk a lot in your work about mm -hmm. demographics shifting and demographics are going to continue to sh shift and that that changes what happens in the classroom. Who, mm -hmm. you know, the pop, how your classroom is populated mm -hmm. changes, changes what happens, changes mm -hmm. what happens in it. Um, but I think that there are longer term things that we have to start thinking about. I'm not sure that we can model it the way in which we have weather forecasting where we can mm -hmm. say that there's a 74% chance of, you know, rain on Thursday. Mm -hmm. um, but I do think that we, we can, we can think about some of these things. I, as, as a futurist, I, I wiping my browsing. Thank you. I, I, I do appreciate that. <laughs> Although we often use the term forecasting, but, but we're not as, we're not as good as, uh, as meteorologists yet. Although we do look at the terrain. Um, <laughs> Tom, your second question was a little more complicated. I want to make sure I understood it. Did you get that? Well, yeah. I didn't, no, I didn't. So you, you were, you're asking about Audrey's critique of, it was, but you, you, had to, you were distinguishing education and technology, and I lost the last part of that. Could you reframe well, it, please? The, the, question, the question I have is, uh, you know, on, on what is the current critique based on, is it the fact that um, in many cases we see technology driving pedagogy? Hmm. And that that's the problem, and, I, and that's one I certainly am on board with. Or is it that, um, or 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 is it that we should have pedagogy driving? If 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 that's the case, the pedagogy drive technology, uh, and the system should adapt to the needs of the teacher. And, and is that if we were fix that, would we solve the ed tech problem? Okay, does that make Wait, what is, I don't know. I mean, what is the ed tech problem? I mean, I have my ideas of what it might be. I mean, I think that, you know, I'm not sure, present company excluded, of course, I'm not sure that a lot of technologists think about pedagogy at all. 
Um, in fact, I think that there's a fair amount, particularly in the sort of what I call the Silicon Valley narrative, mm -hmm. that um, that everyone's an autodidact, and as long as you sort of uh, as long as you sort of give people information, they'll all sort of um, become wildly successful um, entrepreneurs. And I'm I I think that that means that they don't actually think about how teaching or learning happens. Often for these individuals, it was quite easy. Mm -hmm. They never really struggled. Um, this is, you know, this is sort of like the Saul Khan model, mm -hmm. uh, you know, four degrees, advanced degrees from MIT. Um, mm -hmm. I think school came easy for him. Um, and so he hasn't actually spent a lot of time thinking about teaching to people who, for whom it doesn't. Mm -hmm. It doesn't. Right. And, I, I um, went to community college to give you a little background, so I have this in my face all the time. <laughs> and you teach up to uh, four colleges classes a semester on government, so you you see quite a bit of that. Absolutely, yeah. Well, that's a that's a very concise and clear answer, uh, Tom. What, thank you. What what is the proper relationship between technology and pedagogy? I think that's the simple version of the question. Ah, ah. so. You have two hours to speak now. <laughs> <laughs> in five in I mean, seconds or less. I think it depends on what you're, I mean, I think that that's such a broad question. I mean, I think it depends on, on what, what, you're, what you're doing. I think it depends on what you think of as technology. I mean, my favorite technology um, for the work I do as a writer is, off, is having a window with sun shining in. Um, uh, and I have a pen, as I seem to be holding on today, a pen that I really, like, um, I'm not sure <laughs> that we can necessarily talk about one a relationship or and mm. have it be a, a constant across all learning scenarios, all teaching scenarios, all subject matters, Absolutely. all preferences. Yeah, well, that's, that's interesting. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, yes. No, no. Um, it's like for some people understanding Shakespeare means I can recite right. exactly and I know when you're born, when you're born and right. but for people who you know for some people Shakespeare means analyzing what's right. you know, what he's trying to say and what the, the context and yeah. how it was linked to things. So it's it's also Emotion. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I just want to repeat that. No, so we don't. No, no problem. It's a wonderful question. So part of it is that how do we define education? Uh, and and the example you gave was uh, what does it mean to understand Shakespeare or to be educated in Shakespeare? And there are different ways that we can unpack from that. I would say in in every school I go to, people have arguments about the purpose of education. Well, your your debate earlier today was in part about that, the role of economics in education. Uh, I know in the it, there's a branch of American higher education called liberal education, and everyone likes to argue about what that exactly means, and they never agree. It's it's look. Agree. <laughs> well, there's there's your pedagogy that you were describing before, right? People, you know, having contested things. Yeah. So. The purpose um, of education is to make people aware that there are different ways of looking at the world. That's one answer. That's that's <laughs> one answer. By the way, if if you're if you're new to this, what what we just did here, bringing Tom up and uh, and in knitting him into the conversation, this is what we do. Um, and so if, if you're new to it, we can bring people up here uh, all the time. Tom, thank you so much. Good luck with your in-laws. And again, thank you for coming here on Thanksgiving. <laughs> I get along great with my in-laws. Right. Okay. <laughs> we'll see you soon. Uh, I, I'm also conscious of time. We have about uh, four minutes left. So let me see. Um, uh, we have a question for Audrey. And let me just flash this on the screen. Uh, this is from our awesome friend, uh, George Station. Um, and here is his question. Um, re myths. She's been labeled Cassandra, <laughs> but I also see Sisyphus. What's your current myth status? Are you defying or rewriting these myths? Thank you, George. And uh, and good morning to you, George, on the West Coast. I think it's about 11.55 uh, uh, a.m. there. Well, George, <laughs> I appreciate both of those 
difficult tasks that you've assigned me. It's like rolling a rock up the hill, yeah. (laughs) I'm either um, not believed or just, um, I actually feel both of those sometimes. I I like to remind people that I did not decide that I choose the label uh, EdTech's Cassandra. It was a label bestowed upon me. Certainly I would not have chosen chosen to be seen as the crazy woman who no one listens to. to. It's not a particularly fun place to be. Um, I hope that I am defying and rewriting and challenging these myths. Um, And I, sometimes I do feel like the task is, what's the adjective, Sisyphean? Yes. Um, Yes. But um, that would be too depressing. Well, you remember Camus' line, we must imagine Sisyphus happy in doing this. <laughs> um, I suppose. Yeah, well, there, there is, there is, um, George, thank you for that's that. That's a great question. Happy Thanksgiving, George. That's a very kind question. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. We, we have time for one more question from, from all of you uh, before, uh, before we have to wrap up. Um, so um, either those of you who are online, um, if, if, and that's everyone from uh, Tom and Dom, Roxanne, and Ed, now's your chance to get in. Ricardo, um, what questions you have, or those of you who are in the room, what questions you have? We have one. We have a keen eye. Let's bring Tom on here, and I bet you I can guess Tom's question. So let me do this. Hello, Tom. Uh, your mic is muted. You need to unmute. <laughs> Perpetual issue with video. Here's, there you go. All right, I'm working on uh, our climate crisis. And I'm all specifically working on rewriting the myths needed for it. And I'm very sure, very soon, we're going to get our teeth kicked down our throat. And so it's a matter of do your myths, new myths for higher education, include myths in a major uh, life or death worldwide climate crisis? Thank you, Tom. Um, if you couldn't hear that, I, I got this. And l- let me just repeat this for everyone to hear. Um, Tom is, among other things, a, a, a long-running commentator on our program based in the Boston, Massachusetts area. And he's very keen on uh, climate change, and on uh, uh, the, which, when he refers to a clim- uh, planetary uh, crisis, that's what he's referring to. So question is, what kind of myths are we seeing um, coming up around uh, the intersection of higher education and climate change? I was hoping that someone was going to ask about this tip because it was one of the things I've been thinking a lot with the the sort of the the predictions of AI in the future, which seems mm-hmm. to be the, the latest thing that um, the latest thing for the last sixty five years that we've been obsessing that the future will be about AI. Mm-hmm. And I've been thinking a lot about the amount of energy power that yes. goes into artificial intelligence you into electrical engineering. Uh, yeah, engineering. Oh, thank yeah, you, thank you. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, um, the, the power that it takes for machine learning, mm-hmm. the power that it takes to mm-hmm. have these cloud-based systems that can um, spin up more and more process, mm-hmm. more and more processing power. Mm-hmm. Um, it seems to sort of be, we're going to, I wonder if we'll have to make a choice between a future mm-hmm. of artificial intelligence and a future that is sustainable. Um, and it's, it isn't simply the amount of electricity, it's all these other concerns that we have that I don't think that we've really faced about the environmental impact of computing technology. Um, the, the waste, the rare mm-hmm. earth materials and mm-hmm. the geopolitics of the future mm-hmm. of that. Um, mm-hmm. And then I think about just, again, to the question of demographics, mm-hmm. when, when, when things happen with global climate change, um, what are the demographics? How are the demographics gonna change? And how will that change what, how we prioritize what we know and who we decide, whose knowledge we decide to care for? And I think it's, again, this is one of the things that um, I would very much rather we pay attention to um, than some of the other things that I feel we get sidetracked on. Can we talk about this afterwards? Sure. Yeah, I had a, uh, Tom, thank you again for, for carrying that forward. 
I, I hate to pause things, but we are really out of time. And we, have, we are hungry. We have written, and, <laughs> and, and you guys need to have food, or else that will be bad. I want to make sure that you get uh, um, that you get to feed yourselves. Um, let me first of all. Um, I just want to uh, point to our sessions for next week, um, but I also want to begin by um, by saying uh, thank you for everybody. Thank you for the people who came here um, face to face. Um, particularly the wonderful people in the audience who had great questions. Yes. And I just want to say, the, and thank you to the people who, from afar who defied time and space and joined us in the middle of, uh, of American, um, America's national holiday. Uh, and I just think the questions that we got were so rich and varied, everything from the very personal, empathetic questions about careers to the larger questions of what is the purpose of higher education itself or education in general. Um, and let me above all thank our guests. Uh, three wonderful people, for Audrey, and Olivier, and for Jelly, for being so wonderful to be here, starving yourself to be here. Time. <laughs> but also each of you bringing so rich a variety of backgrounds, thoughts, and projects. It's just definitely a delight to see you all. Thank you all. Yeah. Thank you, but Brian. Before you go, let me just take 30 quick seconds to say next week, December 5th, I can't believe it's December already, but we'll have Keith McIntosh. He's the Chief Information Officer for the University of Richmond in uh, Virginia, in the United States. Uh, he's done some pioneering work on supporting minorities in higher education, educational technology. Um, so I'm really grateful for him. I'm looking forward to seeing him next week. Um, also, uh, if you want to uh, keep up with the forum, we have almost four years of videos going back to our guest's first appearance um, in 2016. And so all of that is on YouTube completely for free for you to look at at any time. Uh, and if you want to keep arguing about this stuff, if you want to talk about the great tool that will unite this all, or the design thinking that's part of it, or how does 42 Mesh do what it does? We have places on everywhere from LinkedIn, Facebook, we have uh, a, a Slack channel, and of course we're on Twitter the whole time. Uh, thank you all again. I really admire all of you coming, and we'll see you next time. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, Ryan. And thanks to the AV people for making everything keep going. Thank you. And we'll enjoy OEB. Bye-bye.